Hi, good evening, guys. How are you guys doing today? Um, I have such a terrible, I mean, not terrible, I can't complain about my day, but I had such a busy day. Uh, the jam was very bad when I came back. Um, and uh, I think because of the jam, uh, the person that I'm supposed to interview, Dr. David Koo, is still uh, not in the studio. So I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, coronary artery disease before he comes in. Okay, coronary artery disease is a disease where there are blockages in the heart vessels. And I think I mentioned before that there are three major blood vessels in our heart. Okay, one to the front of the heart, one to the back, and one to the right. Now, the problem with blockages in the heart vessels is that um, it can come suddenly. That's why um, heart attacks can come suddenly, and it's called an attack. Um, and it can come suddenly because there's a blockage due to a blood clot formation. Now, both times these days, 80% of patients, when they have heart blockages, uh, we do what we call an angiogram. It means we visualize the blood vessels to the heart uh, by actually injecting dye into it and taking x-rays. And from there, from the angiogram, then we can decide whether the patient needs any further treatment. If the patient has, let's say, blockages of more than 70%, and of course, in a heart attack, the blockage is expected to be all 100%. means there's a sudden block okay, obstructing the flow to the heart muscle. There's muscle death. That is what's a heart, uh, what a heart attack is. Now, if the blockage is more than 70%, then we will need to balloon and stand the vessel. Now, let me just check on uh, Dr. David Poo. Okay. Okay. He's still not in. So, I go on. Okay. So, um, before I go on, let me just um, explain a little bit more, David, about an angiogram and then I'll let you in. Okay. So, an angiogram then shows the blockage, but there are many a times uh, when we can't balloon the blockage, we can't stand the blockage, we can't offer the patient a non um, non-surgical treatment. So this is where Dr. David Koo comes in. Now, Dr. David Koo uh, is an old friend of mine. Okay, We both graduated from UKM and there is no one, no one more ambitious than Dr. David Koo. Extremely hardworking, very, very adaptable to change. He was so famous in Ipoh, okay, doing so well, decided to relocate to KL because his ambition is burning. And then we work together. Let me welcome Dr. David Koo. Hi, David. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear Mati, hi. I can hear you well. Yeah, okay, you good. Clearly. Okay, um, yeah, we, sorry, uh, I had to rush you because um, usually I like to start on time, but I know the jam and your your work uh, sometimes do not permit you to be exactly on time. So how have you been, David? Um, how was your day today? I've been fine. I've been busy, but fine. I, as usual, because I, I have a big group of sites doing the operations that I could. So I've been a little bit busy, but it's good to keep busy. And yes. I being busy I keep healthy. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. I love being busy. I am one who, who cannot still, as you know. Um, i like you to explain to the audience uh, where everybody knows bypass and open heart surgery. Of course, open heart surgery is not just bypass. There are also valve change. Uh, can you just explain to us okay, the, what's the meaning of open heart surgery? Well, when we say open heart surgery, it's because we open a part of the heart to connect to the heart-lung machine. A lot of people mistake open heart surgery as having a wound in the chest. But in reality, when we say open heart surgery, it is nothing about the chest because we open the chest in any case, anyhow. Except when we do open heart surgery, we connect the patient's heart to the pump. 
And when we connect to the pump, we take over the circulation. So there is open heart surgery, as contrast to closed heart surgery, where we allow the heart to beat, we don't connect to the pump, and the patient's heart is on its own. Okay, so can you open heart surgery means Okay, can you just explain to us what does connecting to the pump means? Of course, uh, we need at this juncture to explain to everybody our heart's main function is to pump. Okay, so uh, a lot of time people don't understand that a lot of our procedures are made more difficult because the heart is a moving organ. It is easy to right. work on say, um, an angioplasty of uh, a peripheral vas vessel because it is not moving. You can look at it and get the exact sizing and the exact placement of the stent. But of course, because the heart is a moving uh, organ, you need to basically um, paralyze the heart, would, I, would you say that, so that you can work on easier yeah generally the reason why we put a patient on the pump is so that when we move the heart around we will be able to get a better control of the blood pressure because the pump takes over the circulation but of course the other challenge is moving on operating on a moving target so the whole idea of putting the heart is to allow you to move to operate on a on a basically a steel target but in reality probably at least on the surface of the heart we do not really need to stop the heart in order to access it and then be able to do the operation. Over the years, we have developed devices that we can use to then stabilize a portion of the heart to movement so that we can do the operation. Okay, so before we go on to the, the part where we don't need a pump to operate on the heart, okay, uh, let's just, um, just explain more about what are the problems we see or the complications that we can get um, with putting the heart on the pump other than the blood pressure being on a lowish side okay is there a difference between a off pump and on pump surgery well generally when you use a circulation that is artificial they are bound mm -hmm. able to face the complication of that. And one of these will be the risk of having a stroke. Second, the risk of having kidney failure. Because the circulation on the artificial pump is not the same as the one you get from a natural beating heart. So when that happens, naturally your end organs, the brain and your kidney, will not get the blood supply as it will get from a normally beat heart. So therefore, put the patient on the pump, you expose the blood to artificial environment. And that, that causes an inflammation. And that inflammation itself can be damaging. As you will see in COVID, in COVID itself, the real harm is, form, is com, coming from the exaggerated immune response from the infection itself. Not so much as the virus infection itself, but also added on by the exaggerated immune response. And that is the meaning of the inflammation we speak about. So therefore, when you put the circulation on artificial pump, necessarily exposing your to this excessive inflammation and that itself causes damage in the form of kidney failure strokes excessive bleeding okay so um we are going towards the debate between open heart surgery with a pump and without a pump uh and i i see this going this direction because you do surgery off pump Am I correct to say that you do a lot of surgeries off pump? You have this uh, passion about off pump surgeries. Yeah. Well, I think all of us heart surgeons are trained to be operating on the on the steel heart with the patient's heart stop being on the pump. For all the years, I, I've done many of those operations. I've seen the detrimental effects of it. And in my mind, you can operate without doing that. Certainly, you will reduce the risk to the patient reduce the complication rate and allow for an easier and faster recovery. But of course, it takes a learning curve. You need to overcome the challenge of learning to operate on a beating target, learning to manage the circulation while the heart is not being supported. And I believe in time, it will be done. And the, the surgery... Sorry, you go on, you go on. Uh, 
Yeah. I just realized my battery is three percent. I'm gonna change to another phone. Oh, can I just give me a minute break? I just bring another yes, yes. phone and can yeah, you can, can. Yeah, I sure. I'll explain okay. I, I will right. I'll explain further. Okay, so basically I was just at this point of time telling you before David coming uh, came in that in any in patients with heart problems, there are many a times where the blockages are so bad, maybe they are, all three vessels are blocked, uh, especially in patients who are diabetic. Uh, Long-term outcome for heart surgery compared to angioplasty is better, uh, not, in not all cases. But uh, the fact is, when patient hears of bypass surgery, they are always very scared. Okay, The risk of bypass surgery um, in a good heart fun a patient with a good heart function, regardless of age, can be quite reasonable, maybe 1% or less. So the fact is, if you do not do this surgery, um, your outcome may be worse. That's one. Two is that um, you may not have a normal lifestyle because you are always um, in pain, especially when you exert yourself. Okay, so not just that your life is shortened, but your lifestyle may be um, affected by the fact that you do not go for further treatment or because you cannot accept this surgery. Now, Dr. David Ku is now trying to discuss or debate between an open heart surgery, okay, or a, a more limited kind of surgery, which is off palm surgery. Now, what's the difference? Is, the difference is that um, most traditional doc, uh, cardiac surgeon would do an off palm surgery. That's how they were trained. Yeah, I'm back. But, uh, yeah, it's much better. Very much better. Better picture, okay. <laughs> connection. You were too laggy just now. Okay, so maybe yeah. You, yeah. I was trying to explain to them. One is that. Actually, when the patient actually needs a bypass, uh, the bypass risk is not necessary. It may sound scary, but the bypass risk is usually not that high. Okay. Uh, secondly, is that uh, what is actually an on pump and what is an off pump surgery? So we were at that point where you were trying to. Persuade your, your, your passion about this off palm surgery. So, can this off palm surgery, of course, done for bypass, be for coronary artery disease? Can it be done for valve replacement too? Yeah. Okay, when we refer to off palm surgery, as I mentioned earlier, they're referring to an operation where you do not use a pump. Now, in that context, we can only operate on things that are visible to you. That means arteries on the surface of the heart. I say you have to operate on a hole in the heart or to change or repair a valve. These are structures inside the heart. And for that mm -hmm. situation, you would have to need to stop the heart in order to have access to the interior part of the heart. And in that context, the off-pump surgery will not be possible. Okay. So basically, it is only for a coronary artery that needs That's correct. the uh, Okay, and this off palm surgery also can do for lima grafting, right? Correct. We can do for all forms. In my mind, for, for the so operation to be acceptable and to be good, you should be able to do everything as you would normally do on the pump. Otherwise, it will be a compromise. So for any technique to be universally accepted and to be able to replace any current technique, you should be able to do everything you would do if you're on the pump. So therefore, in off-pump surgery, we do everything. We either uh, using arteries, using veins, even to remove plugs from the arteries called an atherectomy. So generally, you can do all sorts of operations, provided the heart function is not too weak, the heart is not too big, and you should be able to reach to the back of the heart. So in that situations where we cannot do without the pump, we will still use the pump, but we do not stop the heart anymore. In fact, for me, for bypass surgery, there is no need whatsoever to bring the heart to a stop but if you are changing a valve or closing a hole you obviously have to stop the heart and when you and stop the heart we give solutions 
that will stop the heart as high potassium and that itself will cause the heart to be swollen and that itself delays recovery okay the recovery one is because the heart was uh, is we give the medication to to stop the heart that's one who is the is the surgical scar different from an off pump compared to a on pump open heart surgery I, I think other than putting the heart on the machine the techniques are all the same it, it, it depends a little bit more on dexterity and the calmness of the patient, of the surgeon, when you do off pump surgery. But otherwise, the techniques are all the same. You are stitching the same way, you are approaching it the same way. Only difference is you do not need to stop the heart, you don't use a pump. And therefore, less injury and trauma okay. to the patient. Most times, patients who come to a stage where they need a bypass surgery, okay, um, either they have waited too long, they have not taken their medication, or they have not put the risk factor. So most times, most times they are um, already of the age that they need. They can't do very much. Uh, let's say from angioplasty wise. Okay, how old is the oldest patient that you ever did a bypass or? Oh. Uh, over the years, I've operated on many. I think probably more than 2,000 patients. And I would think, for me, the youngest patient i ever done a bypass on is 26 years old, which is often oh uncommon God. for people who are young. But the oldest patient is 92 years old. Now, this 92-year-old guy is a father to a doctor that I know. His problem is he has left me stem disease. There's oh. about 90% stenosis. And he can't even go to the toilet. Each time he goes to the toilet, he has chest pain. So obviously, we took the risk and do the necessary surgery. And we, he was done off pump naturally. And the third day, he was really reading the newspaper. So I think age is not the issue. The main issue is what is the indication? Is the patient the right candidate? And is the need necessary? If all these are fulfilled, we just have to take the necessary risk and do the necessary. It's very much like crossing the road. If we need to cross the road, we just have to find the safest route. Either you dash across, look like flu right, walk across, take an overhead bridge, or take an underground tunnel. You cannot avoid crossing the road when you need to cross the road. So we need to find the best way. Well, I'm sure you've been to Vietnam, right? Uh, you've been to Vietnam. And if you cross the road, you can close your eyes and cross the road. Everybody will avoid <laughs> you. Have you been there? Yes, yeah. it's true. It's yeah, true. but this is a great based on a bit of luck as well. Uh, we are assuming you, everybody is going to do the same. Yes. No, no. If you're scared, you can't cross the road. Correct. And that's the truth. Okay. In, in Vietnam, it's like that. And then why did the chicken cross the road? To get to the other side. <laughs> okay. Now, coming back to this. Okay. Um, I'm sure um, over the years, when we have treated the patient for so long, I've treated the patient for so long, there are some patients who are um, I think when they give a positive vibe, it's always a good thing. For example, you say that, okay, it's not a method, it's good. Some patients, I don't know why there's so much echo. Is it on from your side? Yeah, I think a bit on my side, perhaps. Yeah, okay, now it's much better. Okay, now it's back. Now it's really interesting. Yeah, okay. I happen to be I happen to be still in a mall. That's why you can, you can feel a bit of echo in a big space. I see, I see. Okay. No wonder I can't make, can make it I can't even make it home on time to to, to join this. So out way I I just thought I found a quiet corner, which I did, and I hope you can you all can hear me. Okay, okay. Like you say I so, was hours. <laughs> yes, you do, you do. I, I rushed back and I made it in time. But I was just going to tell uh, talk about this ninety two year old guy that you, mm. you operated on. And I find that uh, there are certain things that uh, makes the doctor's life easier. And one is positive vibes in patients. Do you, you know, sometimes when a patient walks in and you see, okay, this is a hardy guy. This guy is very positive, okay, and things will go smoothly regardless. And then there are patients who are, you know, good candidate for something. But they, the moment they walk in, they were like, 
am I going to die? Or and I, I really don't like this type of negative vibes because in our field, so as much as we try to do as much as we can for the patients, sometimes um, I don't like negative vibes. Um, and I'm sure your patient must be a very hard kind of person with positive vibes. Well, I think a lot needs to be said about, about the mental preparation readiness yeah. for any major undertaking. To be fair, be it an angioplasty or a surgery, it is a major undertaking for a patient. I remember I used to, I was, you know, you knew I was trained in America. So one of the things we, I like about Americans is they like to use everyday happenings to give you an example of what life is all about in the medical field. For example, we say that when we take an aeroplane, often we are not scared. Because the pilot is there with us. If anything happens to the plane, the pilot goes together with us. Correct? Oh. That's why we are not too scared. <laughs> yeah? I thought so about that. Okay, go on. But, but when we say do a procedure on the patient, the patient go it alone. We just tell the patient it's a calculated risk. We actually do the calculations, patient take the risk. So it's natural for them to feel fearful. I think the most important thing, in my opinion, is First, we must know that we are doing it for the right reason. I often tell patients, you know, we, it's very easy for us doctors to look good, but to do good is the hardest part. Because to do good, we must put the best interest of the patient first. Yes. To look good, we put our interest first. So I, we, I follow that principle a lot in what I do. Because so that if we do it in the right reason for the right, in the right way, chances are in most times, things will be okay. We do not want to give them a false sense of confidence as well. Neither do, do we want to ourselves not confident. So I think you're right. The positive vibes are important. I think at the same time, we ourselves must vibrate these positive vibes as well. Oh, yes, right of course. Yes, Indeed, yes. as well as in mind. Oh, that's very true. That's very true. And I think it's true that if you have best intention for the patient, um, in no matter what, um, and they can feel that intention because uh, having a, a surgery like a bypass done, especially when they know that that there is an option of angioplasty today, sometimes they cannot understand why we do not offer that them that that angioplasty. Okay, but then they must understand. Uh, we are not only treat patients for short term, but we are treating for long term. And one of many studies uh, have shown that, in, especially in diabetic patients with triple vessel disease, they do better long term with bypass. And um, yes, they do better long term with bypass. And you must always remember for the general public, um, for you guys to remember that a bypass sometimes. You really are free of problem for the next 10 to 15 years. First, an angioplasty, you may need to re do repeated procedures. And then the risk and the benefit. So anything that we do for any patient, we take the risk and we take the benefit. If the benefit outweighs the risk, then it is important for you to really consider the treatment that has been explained to you. Now, how about valve replacement? Can you explain a little bit more about valve replacement? Yeah, now before I go there, I just want if I can echo a bit of your sentiment just now. I think what we are doing today, Betty, is we've been working together for a while. And this is where, to me, we cannot undervalue the importance of working as a partnership. Because often, if you end up seeing, say, a very aggressive cardiologist, who do not subscribe to what you say about longevity of the bypass, or you work with a very aggressive surgeon who will bypass anything they see, then often the patient is not giving the right option. But here is where, because we work as a team, we are looking at the interest as a patient as the objective. We will then pick the right treatment option for the patient. Because this is where I think what I hear is all about, where we, we, we spoke about before, where when we work together as a group, there will be situations where I will tell the patient it's better for you to have an angioplasty. 
there will be situations where you say it's better for an operation because we are looking at your interests rather than our own interests. I just want to echo that so that the patient knows that it is a guided decision. Whether the person has a angioplasty or surgery, it should be a guided decision. It's not a decision whether what they want to do or what we want to do is what needs to be done. I think that will kind of hopefully make people realize why sometimes you need surgery, why most times you can get away with your angioplasty. Now let's come to the valve operation. We all know that our heart, being the pump, has got valves. And these valves is allow blood to flow in one direction. Now there are four valves in the body, two on the right, two on the left. And sometimes these valves can be damaged. It can be damaged by infection. It can be damaged by um, aging. It can be damaged even by a heart attack. And that is when we need to do something about it. Now this being mechanical, it therefore has to be sorted out mechanically. And this is when we either repair or replace the valve. And we need an open heart surgery to do that. Because you've got to open into the side of, inside of the heart. And when we do that, we have to stop the heart. We open up to see what's wrong. The heart, the valve can be, has, could be, has difficulty opening or has difficulty closing. Meaning it can't open wide, it can't close tight. In that situation, we can choose to repair or replace. And we will replace, of course, Betty will speak about the type of valves, which is either mechanical or biological valves. Yeah, um, so of course we have mechanical valves that are uh, metallic, okay? And um, these are, can last a very long time. I think the first valve was put in and uh, some patients have survived with the metallic valve for 40, 50 years with no problem. The only problem with metallic valves is that they need to be anticoagulated. So most times they need to be on a medication to dilute the blood Okay, and there's no other choice to it. Warfarin is a, a problem because we need to manage warfarin so that your blood does not become too thin or too diluted, or too diluted or too thick. If not, the valve may clog up. Uh, the other problem with metallic with warfarin is that when you are pregnant, the warfarin can actually cause uh, abnormal. Uh, so that is also one problem. Uh, but otherwise, if you're worried about valve pain, uh, I think valve pain is very, was very, very common, especially because chronic rheumatoid heart disease was a very common disease about 20 years ago. Um, so we, a lot of people, uh, especially the surgeons of, in Malaysia, are very, very comfortable with changing valve. Now, when do you use the when do you use the non-metallic valve? What situation? Okay, generally, whether or not we pick, uh, first of all, if we can, we will try to repair. But when we cannot repair, we have to replace. And whether we use a mechanical metallic or biological valve depends on whether there is number one a need for warfarin whether the person can tolerate it or not meaning if you are young if you wish to have pregnancy then you should avoid warfarin and if you can you like then to be using a valve that doesn't require warfarinization that means you but use a biological valve. yeah if you do a bio biological valve in a young patient then you have a risk of redoing the patient in the future. Yes, correct. The biological valve will last about 14, 15 years max, after which it will close yeah. in So if we have to therefore do a lot of counselling with the patient, if their priority is to have a family, then they have to accept that they will, they will need a reoperation. 10 to 15 to about 14, 15 years later. later. And of course, I... the second operation carries a higher risk. Yes. I Therefore, don't agree we will counsel them. Now, Sorry. there are people who are very concerned about having children. I remember yes. once I had a patient who, when she was very young, she went to an, for an operation in Singapore. I think she was in the teens when they put in a mechanical valve. But now, years later, she grew up to be a pretty young woman and, as usual, fell in love and become pregnant. 
and then of course came back. I was in Ipo at that time. Came back and want to get her reg 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 marriage registered. Now, fortunately, she stopped the warfarin on her own. I still remember the case vividly because at one time in the middle of the night, she started coughing up blood. She had what we know as a pulmonary edema, secondary to a jam valve. Yes. I remember I had to do, I, of course, I counseled the patient and the won't be husband. I was telling them, you don't operate, she will not survive. If you do operate, the baby may not survive. Because we have to do an emergency. Sorry? Oh, she was pregnant at that time? Yeah, pregnant at that time. And she was, because she had a mechanical valve, obviously not enough counseling. Oh, my God. Oh, so such she, a nightmare. Show you her. I remember she was about 21 years old. When she had the first valve operation, she was only 13. So then I have a patient in front of me coughing up blood. So they agreed for the surgery because that's a life saving surgery. I mean, yes, ima imagine, Betty, we have to intubate her sitting because she cannot lie down. We set her up, prop a little bit, intubate, put her under, and do her a, a very quick chest opening and connect her onto a heart lung machine. I managed to successfully change the valve, but as expected, she lost the baby. Now, when that happens, obviously, the husband-to-be start to evaluate the situation. And sadly for her, the marriage was cancelled. Oh! Yeah, and this is an example of where when we are doctors, we are not only looking at the organ we are trying to change or, or treat, but it's a whole person as a whole. We have to look at the social, economic implication, the cultural implication, and advise accordingly so that what we do for the patient will bring benefit rather than harm. Thankfully for her, she's alive. She has probably moved on. I've not followed up with her. But there's an example of where if you do not make the right decision on the right advice, these are things can happen. She's lucky to be alive. In most yes. cases, she won't make it. So this is an example where if you want to have family, you better be counseled, you understand the risk of reoperation, and then you weigh the pros and the cons. If you cannot take the risk, not willing for reoperation, then accept the fact that it is not safe to have a baby on mechanical valves. However, having said that, there have been some patients who had mechanical valve surgery done earlier, became pregnant, then we convert the warfarin to heparin, keep her yes. in hospital, and give her yes. birth to live, healthy babies. But these are very rare. We can't take risks like that. Uh, so I, 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 tend to, I tend to uh, be on the other side where uh, because of the on the first three months. So the first three months is that we need to uh, go more or less with the weight capturing. Yep. But it's always that uh, risk because a lot of people get pregnant. No, because a lot of people get unknowing. A lot of people get pregnant without realizing it. And by the time they yeah, know about right. it, you know, terrestrial genicity has happened. So it's a, it's a very, that's why I said it's a relationship thing. That's why I firmly believe heart treatment has to be done as a group or, or partnership practice. Where there must be a cardiologist involved in it, there must be a surgeon involved in it, and if the surgery is going to be done, then anesthetist involved in it. Because it is a conjoined decision. Obviously, the patient must be involved in that decision making as well. Okay, I'm um, going to take a look at the messages. And uh, hi, Eddie. Thanks for coming on board. And then I'm talking about Klaxane, and I remember that Eddie Punk, uh, Punk used to be Roach, right? Selling Klaxane, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see. Okay. Hazel. Hazel, I've been diagnosed with hyperthyroidism for a year and this is a second recurrence. Doctor advised me to go for radioactive iodine or surgery. Um, okay. I think um, it is best that you listen to your doctor who is an endocrinologist. Um, if your hyperthyroidism is not treated, um, yes, it can weaken the heart due to abnormal rhythm. It True, not always, but then um, your treatment may, if your question is whether you need radioactive iodine surgery, uh, we cannot answer those. Sorry about that. 
and uh, Peng Tang said she will counsel and advise and prepare for mechanical valve replacement. Why mechanical is a better option? There's no discussion about alternative bio valve. I think um, I feel that um, because of your age, maybe um, the fact is that mechanical valve chances of having to change the valve and reoperate again is less. Now, can you just tell the audience what we always worry about? A second by open pipe. Okay. Uh, generally, in respect to that question, yes, we that's use right. this guideline. If you are above 65 years old, we tend to go for a biological valve. If we are, that is for mitral position. In the aortic position, we tend to make that decision at about age 60. Why is that so? We know that if you put a biological valve in the aortic position, it can last longer as compared to the mitral position. So generally, if you are 65 and the valve can last for 15 years, say, you'll be around 80 years old at that time. And even if your valve is not functioning 100%, with your lifestyle perhaps, you're not so active, then you may not need to have another operation. But generally, if you're younger than that, and if your longevity takes you beyond certain age, then you must be prepared for a second operation. That is the, the reason why we use the age as a guide to whether you should have a biological or mechanical one. And to be fair, as a patient, you have every right, and you should try to get to know the choices available. In fact, all of us doctors have the obligation to discuss the pros and cons, you know, in choosing any particular one. So that's in response to that. What was the other question again, Betty? Oh, no, the other question was about hyperthyroidism. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I think we have already explained that. Okay, uh, we go on to one sub-special really interesting. We've done quite a lot of cases. That is hyperhidrosis. Am I not right? Correct. Now, let me explain hypohydrosis to the audience. Hypohydrosis is where you have over 20 pumps, okay? And you sweat so much that it may become um, an embarrassment sometimes. Uh, difficult in many ways sometimes to carry on with normal activity. Uh, activities and uh, I have had one patient in 20 pounds where he changed, changed position of his arm and you can see the sweat fling. Okay, how do you treat this kind of cases? And, and, and uh, it's very interesting that you came to this um, doing this kind of thing. Just tell us about it. Okay, hyperhidrosis happens in about 2% of the population. So it's not uncommon. So if our population is 30 million, you can calculate. There are, there are easily about 60,000 patients with this problem in this country. And worldwide, it affects all races, all sexes. And this is a condition that happens because our sympathetic trunk, the nerve is overly active. And it's overly active because there is some hereditary element in it. I have operated in the whole family parents and children, father and children, mother and children. And this condition is, yeah, it doesn't cause you health issues, but it causes you psychological, social and professional issues. Because all of us need a dry and dry and warm pair of hands in our daily activities of living. So when they have this often, the more anxious they become, the more they think about it, the worse it is. So these are people who often struggle in their own daily work, their own self-esteem, their self-confidence. And therefore, unless we break the vicious cycle, they will continue to be in that state. And this is a situation where I was exposed to it when I was in the United States. And then I had a friend in Hong Kong, I remember. I went to visit him and I, I was saying that he was doing it for the first time. I've been doing this surgery for 19 years. The first time I did was the year 2001. When I saw this operation, because it's done by thoracic surgeons, I look at it, it's not a difficult operation to do. It is a common problem. 
and it is uh, may not be life saving, but it really impacts someone's somebody's life. I remember when I first joined SGMC in 2005, because the first surgery was done by me when I was in Ipoh in 2001. So when I came to, to Subang, I was new, I was trying to tell people of things that I could do. So I wrote an article in the Star. The reporter told me the following day he received 50 phone calls. That is when he said, wow, you make me very busy. He wasn't too happy, obviously. But, but he also frightened me because I only done what? At that time, maybe 20 cases. So at that time, I told myself I need to learn more. So then I Googled the internet. That, and thanks to the internet, I found a person who has done the movie in Taiwan. I wrote to him and said, I'd like to talk to you, visit you, and perhaps learn whether I will cause harm by doing the surgery. So therefore, I traveled all the way to Taiwan. I haven't met this guy before. I still remember he picked me up in a, in a very old car. He was 60 years old at that time. He has done 9,000 operations in 20 years. So he told me, well, hello, welcome to Taiwan. I'm going to a wedding. Can you come with me? <laughs> we'll talk on the way. Here I am, meeting for the first time, going to a wedding of somebody I've never met before. And then we went to the wedding. And this is where I realized in the Taiwanese wedding, halfway through the dinner, they serve the dessert when they do the necessary customary. Here we finish the dinner first and then the dessert, right? Then they do halfway. Yes. Just a distraction from the flow. But that's when I, I spoke to him and he told me the value of this surgery, the modification of technique, and I came back full of confidence, knowing that I'm not going to harm anybody when I do this surgery. And since then, I've done about 2,000 of these operations. This is an operation where we make two tiny holes in each armpit, identify the nerve. When I started, I remember I cut the nerve. But after that meeting with that Professor Lin, I switched the technique to where I clip the nerve and then reduce the sweating in the palms. Of course, you lead to a bit more sweating at the back. But we truly change the lifestyle, the confidence, and the ability to cope of these patients. And I sometimes when I see this patient after surgery, as much as I love to do heart surgery, and as much as we think we help somebody, but I realize that when all these sweaty pump patients, when they come back and see me on the street, I can see that we truly leave a very lasting impression on their lifestyle. So that is... Yes, I would like to shake your hand. This very pump surgery. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> Because I really can Correct. see here once somebody who's just just change the position of the hand and you know the sweat just filling all of us. It is a it is a not an easy I can imagine. But it's a, it's, how long is this surgery? Is, is it a day day case? Yeah, I only take fifteen minutes for the operation. You oh. normally by about two or three hours you go home. It is done under general anesthesia, but only for a very short period. I normally take between 10 to 15 minutes to do both sides, and you're awake by half an hour. You hang around, we give you a drink. You don't want it, you can go home. And we don't need to come back to see me. You just go to the nearest doctor to remove the stitches. So it is a relatively simple surgery, minimal pain, but it will change your life if you even need it. It's very interesting, right? Uh, okay. I think we have spoken for almost 45 minutes. Yep. And um, we're going to close this uh, whole live chat soon. Okay. So I think to recap, one is that um, surgery is so scary. It may be the best option for you for longevity, for life saving, and also for um, your lifestyle. Okay, not not just because we want to extend your life expectancy, but like uh, David said, this 92-year-old gentleman could not even walk to the toilet. So if you talk about somebody who is full of pride, a man who has always been so independent and can't even get to the toilet without having severe pain, then it is very life-damaging. Him. Okay, uh, to ask him to be on, let's say, a uh, diaper, to be bedridden, it is not one of them. 
something that he would want to go through, he may want to take whatever risk that he wants. So sometimes, like uh, David said, counseling, Peng also, want, also said, that counseling a patient is extremely important. Okay. Speaking to a doctor who can counsel you is very, very important. Okay. And then now you also learn about a very easy procedure to save you from the embarrassment of a very sweaty pound. Okay. Um, I have uh, now more and more people are doing this surgery, right, David? Yeah. More, I mean, more as more people learn. Yes, that's but you got to do it the right way. But otherwise, you may sweat too much at the back as well. So okay. we do enough research, yeah, to make sure you need the surgery. Okay, now David, you can go home, get out of the mall, and go home. Okay, I think um, yeah. well, the jam is over now. <laughs> So you'll be safe to go home. The jam was really bad. And then, um, Mr. Fu, where are you going, doctor? I'm going to end the broadcast now. Bye. See you. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I see you on Saturday. Bye. Bye, Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you for watching this live chat uh, with Dr. David Fu, who is a cardiothoracic surgeon. Um, Mr. Fu Chi Kuang asked, where am I going? Um, I'm going to uh, a new few new places. Um, to mention it on a live chat would look like I'm promoting myself. So I would decline to reply that. Um, Thank you very much. I see you on Sunday. Uh, and Sunday, I'm trying to bring you to Mongolia. Bye.